So here we are, um, ready to um, ready to discuss the uh, one of the last things, uh, one of the last uh, uh, topics that I wanted to take up this semester. Uh, the the to whole topic of how the Soviet Union fell between 1985 and 1991. So uh, the real uh, meat of our course is between 1917 and 1945, of course. I've already added uh, some remarks, uh, which you should have seen by this time, on um, uh, the Soviet Union and the Cold War and how it thought about the past, the whole problem of de-Stalinization, relation with the Chinese, the discussion of the question of Stalin uh, between Mao and Khrushchev and uh, related matters. Um, so today I want to talk about the uh, continuing discussion about the Russian um, uh, question, the discussion about Soviet history, the Soviet history that we have been uh, that we have been dealing with, the discussion that took place in the Soviet leadership, because I think it's the whole key to understanding why the regime uh, fell. Uh, they changed the, the ideology. They decided to go back and take a completely different view of Russian history. Um, uh, but they got a little confused as to uh, what they were, what they were going to say about Russian history, and um, and as a result, they uh, they wrecked the whole thing. Um, and I'm I'm going to argue that it uh, comes from the determination of policy based on ideology, based on this whole discussion about what communism is and what direction they should go in. That's the whole thing that caused them to adopt the policies that ended up tearing the regime. Uh, tearing the regime apart. Of course, they didn't intend this. So the whole thing was inadvertent. And uh, that's the first thing that has to be, I think, properly understood by historians who look at this thing in the, uh, in the future. So today I want to talk about that, the fall of Soviet communism. And um, on Thursday, I'm going to give you a, a prompt for a final. I've, I just made this up. You should enjoy it. It looks very jolly. And, and it asks for two essay questions from you, but it gives you a big range of choices. Um, um, for uh, different questions to answer for the essay. I hope you will indicate clearly what answer, uh, what question you are trying to answer uh, in your essays when you turn the thing in. And we'll turn the thing in the same way we did the midterm. I'll give you further uh, uh, notes about that as we, as we continue. When I do send out the prompt, I'll talk uh, uh, once again about how to, how to process it, how to get it to me, and, and uh, how we'll go uh, forward with all the administrative, administrative details. But uh, for now, let's talk about um, Gorbachev's revolution, 1985 to 1991. I guess the first question we would have to ask about the whole thing is, um, is the Soviet Union by this time, has it turned into an ossified bureaucratic system or is it still a revolutionary regime? It's an interesting question for a historian to pose, a revolutionary regime. What do I mean when I say a revolutionary regime? Well, if you took, say, the French Revolution, uh, as an example, um, Napoleon uh, ended up getting power, and some would say the whole revolution was set back because Napoleon acted as a counter-revolutionary in France, but he carried the revolution abroad um, in attacking all of the European countries, and in effect, he destroyed feudalism in Central and East Central Europe. Um, so I don't know that that would have been done without Napoleon. Uh, they tried to reestablish it after Napoleon was gone, but the idea had sunk in, and eventually uh, feudalism was destroyed in, uh, in that, those, those regions of Europe. So you can see the French Revolution continued to be revolutionary, even under Napoleon. Now, um, let me try to ask that same question. Did the um, uh, Russian Revolution continue to be revolutionary, even under Stalin? Trotsky, uh, when he wrote about it, and everybody in the West read a lot of Trotsky's work, and uh, came to conclusions about, a lot of conclusions, because he writes so well and so cogently, um, came to a lot of conclusions about the Soviet regime, whether it was revolutionary or not. Trotsky's argument was that it was not revolutionary after Stalin got old, that Stalin was a Thermidorian um, who set the regime back and, and, and he used the phrase at times, grave digger of the Russian Revolution. And um, that has been taken up to some considerable degree by the people who advocated detente during the 1970s and 80s. They made the argument that, oh, let's not worry about the Soviet regime so much. Uh, let's not worry about it uh, overturning the world. Uh, let's have detente with it. We need it, you know, let's have arms control. Uh, it's only a bureaucratic regime. 
so the argument uh, went. And these are most of the people uh, who were Sovietologists, Soviet experts in my lifetime, contemporaries of mine, and with whom I never uh, really agreed because I thought the Soviet regime was still overturning uh, lots of things throughout the world, still had a very uh, disruptive, uh, violent uh, uh, impact on, uh, on, on the whole world. Uh, and was still quite revolutionary. According to their scheme of understanding, uh, it was quite revolutionary. And I think they were perfectly perfectly right to claim that. And uh, people in the West should have recognized that. And that didn't mean, of course, you couldn't make deals with them. You couldn't have arms control or that you had to have a war with them or anything like that. Didn't mean any of those things. But just in terms of analysis, and especially as it might, um, as it might involve the historian. And as a footnote to all of this, I guess I should say that I am of the opinion or have more or less become set in the opinion that historians really ought to call a spade a spade and forget what policies um, they are advocating at the moment. Don't let their preference for a given policy at a given time affect uh, their view of history. Don't concoct a history uh, that fits some policy recommendation you may have. Like, for example, you like detente, so they're not revolutionary. Uh, their uh, bureaucrats. Uh, no, I don't think that's good. I think the historian ought to put out of his or her mind whatever policy recommendation might come from the analysis and just make the analysis uh, for its own sake. And so that's in that spirit, that's the way we're approaching this thing. Well, was the Re Soviet Union a revolutionary uh, when Gorbachev took power? I think so. I think so. And uh, you see a roster of uh, regimes all over the world who are uh, uh, worker states, basically. And um, they, are, um, they are marching under the banner of communism. And they say it's the communism that is advocated in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is a brother communist regime. They look, in effect, to the Soviet Union for guidance. So here's a map, been searching around for a decent map for this. This one still isn't the decent one that I want, but it's not so bad. And it gives an indication of the spread of communism during the Cold War. As you see, it spreads to China. And after the Vietnam War, it spreads to Vietnam and Laos and it's got a lot of influence in Southeast Asia generally. Uh, turned back in Indonesia in 1965 by this vast massacre that uh, over a million communists um, by the Suharto regime. Uh, but in other places, it gains ground, gains ground certainly in Africa. You see the Portuguese colonies in Southern Africa here. You see Ethiopia, uh, Somalia. Uh, they're calling themselves worker states, communist regimes, looking to Moscow in various ways. Uh, that doesn't uh, prevent a considerable complication. Two communist states, uh, Somalia and Ethiopia, were doing battle at the end of the 70s. <laughs> so these communist states could be hostile one to the other. And we also have to note, and I think we have noted, that the uh, Chinese are quite hostile to the Russians um, uh, during this period. They're both communists. So uh, the spread of communism does not mean that all the communist states get along. Why is that? Because it's a question of power. They get power over states. States have in I interests of their own. So they don't necessarily act as a... Uh, kind of a, in a way that uh, would indicate that the ideology determines everything. They've still got to worry about the fact that they are in control of a state. Um, so that really is the fundamental understanding that everybody who analyzes the Soviet Union, I think, ought to have in mind uh, as they go forward, um, and, and which isn't always the case. That's not always been the case with uh, pundits and experts who've dealt with this topic. Okay. And so they advance in Southeast Asia, they advance in Africa, they advance in Cuba. This map doesn't show the advance in Nicaragua. There's a communist regime in Nicaragua by 1979. Um, and they have a, certain other influences in various other places. I mean, I've left aside the whole question of regimes that call themselves socialist. There are quite a number of them with a lot of nationalized property. Algeria, for example, practically all nationalized. Uh, they call themselves a kind of socialist regime. They're not really in the block or anything like that, but uh, uh, that's the kind of regime they have. So uh, perhaps that has something to do with the Russian Revolution. That's a question we could uh, debate on another occasion if there were ever <laughs> another occasion to debate it. And so when we talk about the spread of communism throughout the world, uh, we're kind of um, distinguishing that from this equal spread of socialism, I think you could say. 
um, uh, throughout uh, throughout the world. And maybe that has uh, something to do with communism. It's a question we can't pursue as it uh, should be pursued uh, right here. Uh, moreover, um, the communists have the idea that um, they're really marching forward um, in an inexorable fashion. Um, uh, they take the view of Alexander Boven, whose picture you see here, one of their leading analysts, um, not exactly a historian, but a person who knows a lot of Soviet history, um, and a very respected person at the end of the Soviet regime in the 70s and the 80s, very, respect, um, very respected uh, Soviet expert. And uh, he makes the argument, or he made the argument, excuse me, at the time, that the um, Soviet Union really would have spread uh, communism all over the globe after World War II if it hadn't been for the Americans coming up with the A-bomb. Americans used the A-bomb against the Soviets. Soviets had to worry about building nuclear weapons. Uh, they couldn't really properly spread the communist idea throughout the world uh, the way they would have liked to. Um, but by the time they got missile parity with the United States in 1969, they had just as many long-range missiles. They had, um, uh, in fact, more nuclear weapons, more nuclear warheads than the United States had by 1969. By the time they got to that point, uh, Bovin said the, uh, the whole gap uh, would have been closed. So that, uh, in effect, the United States, on account of the nuclear weapons, having a monopoly of nuclear weapons for such a long time, uh, was able to turn the clock of history back. That's the way he put it. And, um, and now that they had um, uh, missile parity after 1969, well, the clock of history would start running again. Now, you know, I, he wrote this, and I was fortunate enough to um, collar him in, at a conference once and sit down with him uh, over drinks and uh, really discuss this at some length. And uh, he really laid these ideas out very, very well, well honed, well thought out um, um, way. Um, and he was a very influential person. I, I'm sure he spoke for many people in the leadership. The leadership certainly acted as if they felt this way. Very, very confident that the communist idea had basically after all its difficulties, won the Cold War, won the Cold War, or at any rate, was way ahead in the Cold War. And um, in fact, I would say that the people who argued that the Soviet Union fell because the Soviet Union, they knew that it wouldn't work, or they knew it was collapsing, or the cause was failing, or you, that's where you hear it now uh, from most uh, people who write on the topic. I think that's idea, that idea is all wet. I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, the uh, historian has got to note that when Gorbachev came to power in 1985, the Soviet Union was really at the height of its um, accomplishment. And if anything, you could accuse them of arrogance. Uh, <laughs> arrogance. Um, and they took up the reforms in the Soviet uh, uh, period, in the uh, Gorbachev period, they took up the reforms in the spirit of, um, what's the word, complacency. Uh, that uh, so much had been won, uh, that all the little wrinkles, the other little things they wanted, they could very easily be got uh, by this or that policy change. Uh, that they were very much in the driver's seat when it came to uh, the international relationship with the capitalist world. So um, that's an idea that I think um, is worth, worth considering. Uh, you won't always see that with most of the people who write on this topic. And, it's a natural tendency, uh, you know, one would have to expect a tendency like this uh, when uh, you see somebody that you've been fighting against uh, for many, many decades and they collapsed to claim that they had a collapse, had to happen, it was inevitable. Or maybe you say your idea is better than theirs and um, your idea had to get the upper hand, it all had to happen. I don't think it had to happen, and I think it all happened, strictly speaking, and in fact, that's what I'm going to be arguing now, it happened by accident. It was inadvertent. Nobody predicted it. Nobody guessed it. Um, about the only person who understood it while it was happening uh, in the West was Ronald Reagan, and all his advisors were against him on it. I'll go further into that point as we, as we progress. Uh, but at any rate, Soviet Union, very full of themselves, missile parity, 
strategic arms limitation. Their idea of arms control was they forced that on the West um, because they had uh, missile, missile parity. Um, new worker states on three continents, George Kennan's idea of containment completely scotched the idea uh, of containing communism out the window. They had to burst through containment in Southeast Asia, burst through containment in Africa, even burst through containment to a certain degree in Latin America with Cuba and Nicaragua. So Salvador was fighting. Uh, that might have turned into a communist regime. Uh, the revolutionary idea that continued to turn the world, uh, turn the world around. Moreover, capitalism was collapsing. And Abovin said he thought uh, uh, the contrast between uh, the capitalist economy in the West and the Soviet economy was quite striking. Uh, the capitalists had abandoned the gold standard in 1971. Their, their financial system was in absolute chaos, turmoil. Um, the internal contradictions between the uh, Europeans who um, you know, um, had these uh, piles and piles of euro dollars and piles of dollars that you could collect gold for in the past. You could no longer collect gold. They are very unhappy about that. The contradictions were enormous. Uh, the uh, capitalist system was in effect falling apart. And if, as a matter of fact, the way most of these Soviet pundits thought about it, uh, they wondered what they could get out of the West, what they could get out of the capitalists in the West. Um, as the capitalists declined and as the Soviet Union marched forward. Um, but just the opposite of the way it's commonly argued um, uh, today. Um, they were asking that old question that Lenin asked way back in 1922. Uh, people said, you know, you think you can really deal with the capitalists? Do you think they'll be willing to loan you money, give you, uh, give you recognition, open up trade with you uh, when you claim to be so revolutionary? think you can really do this? And, and Lenin answered, of course, oh, of course they will. Of course they will. If they see some profit in it, uh, they'll, they'll do it. It's in their nature, Lenin. Lenin used to say, uh, you know, it's uh, if we uh, wanted to hang them, well, they would try to sell us the rope with which to hang them. <laughs> oh, that's a typical Lenin, uh, Lenin phrase, very sharply, very sharply put. I think that's very much the way they're thinking in 1980 or so, 1982, 83, as the older people in the regime started to pass from the scene and uh, Soviet leaders started to look around for somebody younger, perhaps make a new start, perhaps, you know, collect some of the, um, some of the benefits of their position of superiority. I think this is the, this is the, the prevailing, the prevailing mood. Uh, well, you know, they shouldn't have been, they shouldn't have been so arrogant. They shouldn't have been uh, so confident as all that because um, uh, things were um, brewing in the West that were going to go against them. Uh, there should have been at least a couple of notes of caution. Not to say that they had to collapse because of this, but notes of caution. Well, Ronald Reagan is one of them. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan's coming to power in 1980 means the end of detente. So up to that time, American leaders take the view that uh, they want to have detente arms controls. And in fact, Reagan did not depart from that idea, uh, but he just said there had to be linkage. They can't misbehave the Soviets while we're uh, signing arms control agreements with them. And um, when they do uh, build up our weapons and uh, you know, shock them as much as possible with our arms buildups and any other devices we can think of, um, they're marching all over the globe and we have to put up some resistance. He's especially uh, animated by Central America, by Nicaragua, by San Salvador, um, uh, by the spread, as he understands it, of Cuban influence in Latin America. Sure, that's that makes sense for him to say that. Um, um, he's he's exercised by those things and uh, wants to put up as much resistance as uh, as possible. Um, whole question though, uh, has he got weapons? Has he got cards to play uh, with regard to this? Uh, not well thought of in the Soviet Union. They think he's kind of a lightweight, uh, an actor, um, he's a personality. You know, I mean, we sort of have the same thing now. A person who's regarded outside our country as a personality more than a genuine politician, statesman, diplomatist, um, all the rest of that. Um, um, 
And uh, so uh, the, the Reagan administration starts to adapt an attitude toward the world that uh, we're going to try to take them on as much as possible, try to defend against them. They, the Reagan administration begins with the idea the Soviets are getting the upper hand. It begins with that idea. And we've got to resist it as much as we can all over the world. So it is a cartoon that has to do with that idea. Reagan's view of the world. A lot of people in the United States criticized Reagan for uh, being too up in arms about the whole process. You know, this, this is a point that they have that, you know, Reagan might not have been so worried about everything. The Soviets did make some gains, but these were not the kind of gains that were going to really overthrow the American system or overthrow any big country in Europe or uh, there were only gains are going to be made in this or that country. I mean, maybe they'd affect somebody's bottom line, but no fundamental threat to American national interest uh, by the expansion of Soviet communism. And the way the communists quarrel with one another, you could practically see there were going to be opportunities and many opportunities already with the Chinese, for example, um, for action against the Soviets, uh, together with communist regime. But anyhow, Reagan didn't see it that way. He thought they were up against the Soviet Union all over the all over the globe. And uh, more than that, um, he saw to it, um, and the people who worked with him especially saw to it that um, uh, they stressed as much as possible to the Americans the idea that the Russians were preparing for war, which was not the case. Not at all. Uh, you could say this was a kind of hoodwinking uh, of the American public that took place. Uh, attacks on the CIA and its integrity. So the CIA had produced some very good estimates, shrewd estimates. They'd done a good job with their intelligence, in my opinion. And uh, they were not arguing um, that the Soviets uh, you know, were, were trying to make war or uh, were outstripping us in any kind. Of, presented any special threat to the United States. And um, the people who brought Hagen, uh, Reagan to power uh, put together a Team B uh, to give a separate assessment from the assessment of the CIA, a criti criticism of the CIA. Um, you might say uh, a revolt against the CIA, if you want to put it more strongly uh, than that, and to produce completely different uh, estimates, materials on which they, they hunted up in a hurry and got them and uh, made this case uh, uh, with straight face in the early days of the Reagan administration. The Soviets are preparing for war. We've got to prepare for war. Um, so, um, so this was so, uh, something that, uh, that Reagan could, a card that Reagan could play, I guess, in, the, in, in public. And, and the other card was uh, what became known as the Reagan Doctrine, and, uh, uh, mostly operated through um, uh, through the leadership of this person, uh, Carl Gershman is his name, head of the uh, National Endowment for Democracy. That is still in place today. The national, and he's still got that job. Uh, so he's been in that position for uh, since 1983. You know, it was a long, long time. And this is a very well-established organization with a huge budget uh, that um, sponsors uh, democratic um, and other, and other uh, activity all over the globe against communism. Um, so a lot of people came under the aegis of this program and, and this perspective. And so money was going out really to anybody who would help us against communism. And Reagan, in fact, took it quite far. Many people take this view, and I think I'm one of them, that he took it um, um, extraordinarily far uh, by calling in all the jihadis he could find and uh, giving them every kind of encouragement. And among them was, uh, in fact, Osama bin Laden, who ended up carrying out the attack on the Twin Towers in New York in, um, um, in 2001 uh, on 9-11. So they, he originally got his help from Reagan. And that's all uh, a problem of, of, the, uh, of the Reagan doctrine. It raises the question of, uh, is it smart to take on communism in this way? Or is it smart to take the view that you'll oppose communism by any means? Um, many people, American public, did not see that did not see that perspective uh, that way, that the smartest way to deal with the spread of communism, uh, such as it was, uh, was to support anybody uh, who's against it, no matter how, how to put it, unreliable, reactionary, uh, untrustworthy, criminal, criminal in some cases, 
uh, to support just about anybody against it. And that was the problem uh, that was being debated at the time. So that, add all these things up together, you say, gee, this Reagan administration was really, uh, was really going a long way with this whole thing. This is a popular cartoon from the time called Boondocks about a little African-American kid, <laughs> kind of a bumptious character. And um, there he is uh, calling the terrorism tip line and he's saying, uh, I've got somebody uh, who, uh, got somebody who, uh, who is uh, plotting, what, 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 he's helped, uh, helped train and finance Osama bin Laden, you know. <laughs> a, and uh, they said, give us his name. And he says, Ronald Reagan, it's Ronald Reagan. Yeah. So, uh, so there it is. That's the uh, that's the problem. And uh, there, Reagan came under a good deal of criticism from liberals and uh, people on the left as a result of that. Okay, so that's one of the problems uh, that we have there about Reagan and Reaganism vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, now, uh, before, uh, uh, or excuse me, vis-a-vis <laughs> uh, Reagan, Reaganism vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets and communism. Uh, before I go into that, let me stop for just a second and talk about another debate. Um, about whether Reaganism, whether the arms build up, all the rest of that stuff, whether the arms build up uh, was really what it seemed to be, whether it was really a, a strategy to exhaust the Soviet Union. So the, this argument has been kicked around since the Soviet Union fell that, oh, Reagan did it, you know, Reagan, the arms build up, they couldn't keep up, they couldn't build all those weapons. What? Soviets can't build weapons? Come on. But anyhow, that's the way the thing was argued. Oh, they couldn't keep up with all these weapons that Reagan was building and blah, 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 blah. And that had a huge impact. Well, huge impact. Yes, well, it had an impact. But huge, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not convinced that, uh, at all by that. I think the historians will look over this in the future. I'm not going to be convinced by that at all when they look at the evidence. And they might even entertain a hypothesis. I would like to suggest a hypothesis that they might entertain as an alternate. The idea that uh, the United States was taking a lot of big losses from communism uh, geopolitically. It was losing various countries in various places. And countries around them were taking note of that. And uh, so it all looked kind of bad. Capitalism was not in great shape during that period. There were uh, tremendous uh, crises as a result of the oil shocks, the uh, you know quadrupling of the oil price in 1973. And the economies of the West were kind of a big mess. Uh, during that period, then moreover, you had the Shah of Iran, and oh, yeah, a lot of things were uh, were going uh, awry. The Shah of Iran was overthrown by the Khomeini Revolution in 1979. Maybe with all these things happening, that um, all the actions that the Reagan administration took against the Soviets, uh, maybe they represented not so much an exhaustion strategy, but a kind of an alibi. Anyway, that's what I thought as these things unfolded. That. Uh, it's entirely thinkable. In fact, it's the most, uh, uh, the most compelling thought that uh, Reagan had to cover himself, taking all these presumed losses that are in the newspapers, that are in the headlines, taking all these losses, and uh, it was kind of an alibi to say that we're going to build weapons. This is a motif of the Cold War after uh, the U.S. Uh, had so much trouble subduing um, the North Koreans in Korea, uh, the United States immediately went to uh, 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 building weapons. Um, there's a, always an tendency, I think, uh, to build weapons as a kind of an alibi when you are losing on some other, some other front. And you can always say that it strikes a blow against the enemy, but one can never calculate exactly what that means, especially since the enemy is just as well armed as the United States. And just as easy, just as able, I should say, just as easy, as able, <laughs> as able uh, to build weapons as the United States. You know, whatever you build, you're going to be able to build something up. So, uh, um, so there, there we are. Was it just an alibi? So that's just a thought, and, and I, that's indicated on your outline, uh, that interjection. All right, there's under the heading of um, uh, notes of caution, though, in the period of Soviet um, arrogance, arrogance. Uh, first note of caution is uh, the end of daytime with the United States with the onset of the Ra uh, Reagan administration. What's the second note? Second note is China. China has turned against the Soviet Union. This is the big point of the Cold War. Um, that the stronger the Soviet Union has got, uh, the more hostile China has got. 
all is traced, in my view, not to their quarrel about the Stalin legacy, although I would love that. It, um, that's something that makes history at the center, puts history at the center of things. Um, I would love to say that, but I don't think I can. Uh, it's not uh, on account of the, the, their differences of opinion about the Stalin legacy. It's about the Soviet refusal to give the Chinese nuclear weapons help in 1958. So after that, the Chinese have to look at the whole nuclear picture in terms of the US and the Soviets with a lot of weapons, the Chinese with not much. In fact, they didn't even test a bomb until 1964, okay? Uh, and if the US and the Soviets come to terms over China, that's a no good. As uh, my uncle Luigi would have said, that's a no good. Um, no, no. So that's what the Chinese and what Mao, so Mao is thinking. And quite a bit on, uh, also connected with the relationship with the Chinese, but suffice it to say, for our purposes, we have to take note uh, of a enormous hostility. Uh, you might say it has reached the point where uh, the Chinese oppose the Soviets even more than the United States does. I would certainly say that. Um, right up until the Gorbachev era, uh, the Chinese are the most vociferous opponents of the Soviets, and they oppose them on every question. And some of these revolutionary questions I'm talking about, the Portuguese Revolution in 1974, the new communist regimes in, in, uh, in South, uh, South Africa, um, Angola, Mozambique, uh, etc. cetera. Um, in those cases, the Chinese are against that. Uh, and more than that, the Chinese throw in their lot with uh, apartheid South Africa against the Angolan communists, uh, who they think are under the thumb of Moscow. Well, that's how far the Chinese are willing to go with the whole thing. Chinese support Pol Pot, this ghastly person in Cambodia, for carrying out hideous massacres, uh, which the Soviets and Yugoslav cameramen go and photograph in 1978. Uh, the Chinese support him. So do the United States, as a matter of fact. No good. Um, really going too far with the, um, the idea of putting a minus wherever the Soviets put a plus. Not always the best way to oppose, criticize, um, differ with them. Uh, impose them politically, oppose them politically, if you want to think of it that way. Not always the best way to do that. Um, but at any rate, the communist China, I think uh, one might even say it's the greatest enemy. So there are two notes of caution then in this ambitious uh, picture uh, that we've noted. But I think we have to say on the whole, or at any rate, I would say on the whole, that there's a grand historical a contradiction, a dilemma in the communist idea at this point. It's not what most people think it is. Most people, with, you know, defender of the capitalist system in the West, says, well, because socialism doesn't work, communists are socialists. So that very, fairly straightforward, easy <laughs> interpretation for a person like that. Uh, but I think there's a contradiction nevertheless. And the contradiction is that all our victories are in the third world. They say they're not in the main metropolitan centers that are capitalistically developed in the Marxist sense. Communists don't get any victories there. there are no proletarian revolutions, the way you would hope. As I've said before, I think I'm alone in saying this, but I will continue to do so. Uh, the communist idea uh, moves according to war communism, not according to proletarian revolution in the West. Well, that's the contradiction. They're never going to win in a big advanced country. Uh, they got close with Portugal in 1974 and might have spread into Europe, but it didn't happen. And they are winning in the third world. They are winning in, um, how to put it, economically backward countries. They are winning in these places. Is this a strategy for winning against capitalism? Are you, what are you going to do, surround them uh, in the world hinterland, the countryside? surround the advanced metropolitan center. Is that Marxism, by the way? Marxism doesn't say that. Uh, but the Chinese have said that at various times. During the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, Lin Biao, the army man that you see on Mao's right here, he made the argument that the whole hinterland of the world was going to turn communist 
and they were going to squeeze and strangle uh, the more advanced uh, economies. Uh, opposite of Marxism, in my opinion. Karl Marx would really have gagged on this thought, it strikes me. Um, not to say it wasn't a revolutionary thought, it, well, it was certainly revolutionary, but um, not in the Marxist, uh, not in the Marxist way of looking at things, but that was Lin Biao's view. Well, in a way, it kind of sharpens up the idea. Suppose the communism did develop that way. Is that, uh, is that a road that's going to go anywhere? Uh, you know, they're all backward countries. And, and uh, what goes with this is if they gain power, they're not going to become big economic colossi, Angola, Mozambique, you know, uh, Laos, Vietnam, they're not going to be a big economic power. And in many cases, uh, some new regime, Ethiopia, or some place like that, Guinea-Bissau, probably have to help them. And the Soviets, of course, they, they do this great generosity toward communist regimes, give them a lot of assistance. But uh, that means the spread of the revolution means just taking on more people that you have to take under your wing, basically. How are you going to use them against the capitalists in the advanced places in North America and in Europe, the big economies in Japan? How are you going to use them against those big economies? But anyway, that's what Lin Biao was preaching. And there, that kind of, in my opinion, that highlights the, uh, the whole idea that, uh, that communism had a long run threat, how to put it, to destroy capitalism. It was doing splendidly, you know, in the great struggle against imperialism. No doubt, no getting around that. It's the biggest influence, in my opinion, in destroying British, French, um, uh, Dutch, Portuguese imperialism. The biggest, the biggest influence in doing that. But um, whether it's going to win the whole contest with capitalism on a world historical scale, that's the dilemma. Um, that probably is not going to go. That's, in any event, that's my thought on the, uh, on the matter. Um, I guess there are a couple of other ideas associated with that that most people don't pay any attention to, but I insist. <laughs> One is the problem of the intelligentsia. So in a regime like, uh, say, Russia or China comes to power, real Marxists are going to say, well, this is a proletarian dictatorship. What, is it, uh, what does it amount to? And uh, they have to admit, if they really get down to it, they have to admit that the proletarian dictatorship amounts to um, a, rule, a rule of the intelligentsia. In fact, that's what socialism would be. The intelligentsia would more or less rule. Um, uh, technical people, scientists, engineers, you sort of see that now. The people who are saying the only way out of this enormous problem we have with the plague on the one hand and the destruction of the earth uh, by through global warming on the other only way we have out of this is a pretty strong state or a stronger state than we've known dedicated to the public interest rather than to the market um, in which the scientists and the engineers kind of tell us hey, let's not destroy the planet there are limits to uh, the fun that can be had making money um, there it is. That's the dilemma. The intelligentsia is up. And so then you start to ask yourself, what does the intelligentsia want? And uh, more pointedly, what does the intelligentsia want in a backward country that's communist? Hmm. What do they want? As it turns out, the answer that history is giving us is that maybe they want capitalism. Hmm. Would this be the case if Russia and China were highly developed. Would they want capitalism? I don't know about that. Maybe not. Who knows? But during the period we're talking about, they're both kind of rather still backward. I mean, they're getting very sophisticated when it comes to weapons, but they're still rather backward, generally, in the Marxist, in the Marxist uh, sense. And they're all Marxists. So this is the problem. What to do about the, the intelligentsia? And you still find it in a country like Cuba, for example. Uh, I visited Cuba a couple of years ago, I was driven around by some guy who was a MD, doctor, driving a cab. So what's up with that? I asked him. He said, oh, well, we have to uh, 
I have to get uh, kooks, you know, these uh, hard dollars um, that tourists have to spend when they go to Cuba. Well, I have to get these things. I have to get this money. It means that your standard of living is going to be a little better. Well, you know, what is that? The aspiration under communism of the intelligentsia to better, better themselves. You know, better. You say everybody feels this way under communism, capitalism, anywhere. Everybody wants to, you know, do better. Um, of course. Um, but how about the intelligentsia after it reaches a certain point? Um, are they going to make a market choice? What can a capital? What can a communist regime do to offer them uh, something else other than simply being capitalists? Um, and it strikes me that there are only a few things: um, cultural advance, that sort of thing. Um, make them more prominent. Give them more um, recognition, um, and the rest of that. So those are dilemmas of the communist regimes that will continue to be, uh, as long as there are communist regimes, they'll have to think about how to make the intelligentsia happy under communism, how to give them more of a sense they're running things and all the rest of the rest of that. Then the other question that emerges with that is, is that connected to the idea of democracy? These communist regimes do not, um, do not measure up uh, according to Western standards of democracy. Now you could say we are under a lot of illusions about our democracy. We think it's more democratic than it really is. Um, and maybe we overestimate what democracy can produce for us in changing our lives, making things better, etc. And maybe we're, we wonder about the idea that under democracy, we can have such enormous differences in the economic situation of peoples, such insane equality, uh, which gets worse all the time under democracy. This makes no sense. Um, so democracy has its problems, not to, not to deny you know, problems. Well, nobody wants to go without democracy. <laughs> I doubt of any of you, maybe there are some of you, but I, mean, I doubt of any of you take the view that uh, to hell with democracy. No, no. We all, we all know that uh, maybe it's the worst system, but it's better than all the others. <laughs> it's a kind of a paraphrase of a, a remark of Winston Churchill. Um, <laughs> it's a terrible system, but it's better than all the others. Um, but uh, how about the communist regimes? Uh, what does democracy mean to them? And uh, the most important thing, under the circumstances of the history they've been, all been through, which we've been studying in this course, what happens when you introduce democracy and ask the people, now that you've been through all this history, what do you want? Are they prepared <laughs> to make a decision there? Uh, does it, uh, what kind of decision is it going to be? Is that a decide against the regime? We decide we want to see the regime overthrown? I think often that you do see that. These are interesting problems, in my opinion, that are worth debating. I don't want to close them all off by giving you some formula how to deal with it right now. But these are interesting kinds of problems that all of us, in my opinion, all of us have to think about. Um, in 1985, the communists brought Gorbachev to power. Ah, there's a Lin Biao, before we go to that, there's Lin Biao's whole cause of world revolution hinges on the struggles of Asian, African, and Latin people. who Overwhelmingly make up the world's uh, majority of the population. So the anti-white, so can communism march on anti-white doctrine? Doesn't it have to have an economic, uh, some kind of economic promise? Is it the revolt of all the hinterland? Is it the revolt of the peasants against the workers? The real problem with uh, the Lin Biao point of view, and uh, that relates to this notion I was uh, referring to about the historic dilemma of the communist idea. Um, this is and Andre Gromyko, most experienced Soviet diplomat who'd been around for decades by the time Gorbachev came into power. In fact, he was under Stalin, worked with Stalin in the 40s. Um, and so this is a, taken considerably before Gorbachev ca came to power. He's looking younger, but always a very good looking man, very smooth guy, very uh, shrewd kind of analyst. And in my opinion, had very, a lot of good ideas about um, 
Soviet foreign policy, and he wanted detente. The Kiss Nixon Kissinger detente. Let's get back to good relations with the United States. Um, even if we are, you know, making all these revolutionary gains everywhere, let's figure out a way for to make them uh, compatible with the thinking of the United States. And then, well, Hasha didn't put that very well. Figure out a way to make the United States tolerate them. Uh, figure out a way for uh, relations between our countries to continue on an even keel throughout whatever historical processes may unfold. Maybe that's a good way of putting it, a way that maybe Andre D'Amico would have, would, have, would have put it. So this is the attitude of the Soviet Union toward the, toward the Reagan arms buildup. Let's, come on, let's, uh, let's not quarrel. Let's get back to detente and all the rest of it. Mikhail Gorbachev, who came to power in 1985, um, was an, uh, uh, a rival of Gromyko's, did not like all of the prestige Gromyko had and uh, argued that we have to go further than this. Not enough to get back to detente. To end the Cold War entirely. Yeah, 1986, he started to argue that. We have to end the Cold War entirely. Throw the weapons in the sea. They practically said something like that at Reykjavik at the end of 1986. Everybody was aghast. Reagan's uh, 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 advisors, Gorbachev's advisors, the two men talked for three days in this, in this way. Uh, but of course, they never got together. They never settled the whole question, never decided to move forward on the thing. But they talked wild ideas about ending the whole Cold War and throwing all nuclear weapons um, in the trash bin. Um, and uh, they alarmed everybody around them. Uh, <laughs> when, they, when they got home, they found out that it was horrendous. And Gorbachev, same way. Uh, the people who elected Gorbachev to the leadership uh, were thinking about somebody they might have elected, in which case we would not be having the, this discussion that we're having. I'm going to go to you, Romanov, the head of the Leningrad uh, app party apparatus. Um, who would have been a much more, how to put it, conventional person con uh, to lead the regime, and Gorbachev turned out to be, uh, did not want to take a whole lot of chances, uh, was um, advised and supported by Nikolai Ogarkov, a general who had written a book called History Demands Vigilance, uh, the central argument of which was, if uh, the, the United States threatens us in any way with an arms buildup, with uh, Star Wars type of weapons, the rest of that, eh, we know how to build weapons. And uh, we have faced this in the past, and let's go, we'll build them. So that would have been the move of Romano. Gorbachev did not take that view. He thought that um, one could use diplomacy and figure out a way around this. And it was very uh, interesting in that way. In fact, it might have been might have been a good idea. Of course, anybody who regrets what the whole thing, the way the whole thing happened, that would include the Russian communists today, certainly would look back and say, gee, too bad they didn't elect Romanov instead of Gorbachev. And, well, we wouldn't have uh, gone through all this. They're certainly right uh, to speculate that way. If they had put him in power, undoubtedly, um, they would not have gone through all of the agony that they went through with, Gorb with Gorbachev. Um, and um, before leaving Romanov, well, I'm only going to make this one point about him, but uh, before dropping the topic, I guess I think we should say that maybe Romanov took the view that we have to do basically those things uh, that Putin was going to do later, and that Putin has done since the Soviet regime fell. Um, we have to muscle up. We're going to have to make sure that we protect the national interest against the United States all the rest of that. Um, so uh, a, a certain amount of wistful uh, speculation uh, centers around the idea of a Romanov as an alternative to Gorbachev. But they got Gorbachev, and Gorbachev said, um, we no longer stand for class struggle in the world. That was the first major ideological pronouncement he made. We don't stand for class struggle anymore. We stand for universal human value. That is to say, we don't take the view we've got to destroy capitalism. We take the view that both us and the capitalists, both we, excuse me, and the capitalists uh, have to march together to solve human problems. And what he had in mind by those things was, well, danger of nuclear war, 
threats to the health of the planet, um, global warming, to all, all the things. In, you can think of plenty of things uh, that come under the heading of universal human values. Of course, I mean, it's designed to appeal to people in the West, and it's, it makes a certain amount of sense. By the way, though, can we afford to think this way? Is this kind of naive? If you, if you really believe that you're going to act in terms of universal human values and not worry about your own state, whether it's going to survive? Or let me put it a different way. Are you going to take the view that you're going to let your state suffer because of universal human values? You might get into trouble doing that. It's a cruel world out there. But there's a problem. Uh, in the leadership, then, from this point on, people who quarreled with uh, Gorbachev thought he was going too fast, or thought he was naive, thought he was going to get had uh, by the imperialists. That's the way they would have put it. People who did make that argument would say that uh, we still stand for class struggle. Gorbachev has ab abandoned class struggle, and he now goes for universal human values. That was the, uh, the watchword, if you will, to identify which faction uh, you were with. You could ask somebody. Uh, about that, you could you would know which faction, uh, whether they were pro Gorbachev or or against, uh, by asking them that that question. Um, these universal human values, um, they they were manifest in the attitude toward toward the United States. So Gorbachev said, "Let's, let's get back to arms control," and he did with Reagan. But they ended up starting to do some really very dramatic, uh, dramatic things. Um, and Reagan, you have to say, was rather a convert to Gorbachev. It's not normally recognized by Reagan historians. They don't appreciate Reagan, strictly, strictly speaking. But they think, or at any rate, they want to make it out that Reagan drove a hard bargain against the Soviets and drove them out of business because he was a tough guy. Mm, that certainly would have fit his general profile, but once Gorbachev came on the scene, he took the view that Gorbachev's turn back to Lenin was a terrific thing. Well, they conducted a number of arms control agreements. After one meeting in 1988, after they had signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement, uh, which ended um, the whole problem of the, their, their uh, Euro missiles, their forces in Europe, uh, ranged against each other. That was a big step in arms control, and not arms control, disarmament uh, that they took. Uh, that's, you know, the, the totals came down. Arms control, you're regula regulating how, how, how the totals will go up. Well, any, uh, at any rate, after this um, discussion, with, uh, he was led around the Kremlin. They took him to a place outside the Kremlin wall where the Tsar cannon is. This is a silly old cannon that uh, Peter the Great built. And uh, it has these stupid cannonballs there <laughs> all piled up. Presumably going to hurl a projectile. Like, the thing was never fired. It was a big joke. The, um, the Tsars took the view that, you know, invite, a, invite some foreign diplomat in and to show them the cannon, they'll be impressed. That's the whole idea of the thing. It was kind of an amusing idea, the Tsar cannon. So he took um, Reagan around the Tsar cannon, and um, he asked him in front of reporters, do you still think the Soviet Union is a, uh, is a evil empire? And uh, Reagan said, well, maybe not. Maybe it's not. Wow. And then Gorbachev, Gorbachev said, look at that. He said, this just goes to show what the ancient Greeks always said, that uh, things always change. You can't throw a stone in the same river twice. Things always change. This man used to call us the evil empire. Now he says, no, we're not. <laughs> Gorbachev was perfectly right, in my opinion, to crow about that. He had won Reagan over, won him as a con won the public opinion of the world. The public opinion of the world was crazy about him. They liked him better than Reagan. Um, and uh, what did it mean exactly? when Reagan said that they were not the evil empire anymore. Reagan was asked about this when he came back to the United States. He said, do you think the Soviet Union is changing? And, well, he said, well, and uh, Reagan said, well, they're going back to Lenin. 
He said, um, you know, it's not a Stalin regime. It's a Lenin regime. And, you know, Lenin's a little, from our point of view, Lenin is more, is better for us. Um, and he, Reagan, of course, made mention of the new economic policy of the 20s. You, you will know all about that. Or others might not know, but you will know all about the new economic policy. It was a kind of a semi-capitalist regime. And that's true. They were thinking in those terms. And Reagan was perfectly right. Reagan had it sized up. Good analysis. Good analysis, in my opinion. They were thinking about that period. Uh, but the Washington Post jumped all over him, and uh, a lot of critics in the United States, people all around him, Henry Kissinger, they were all saying, what are you talking about? Lenin's just as bad as Stalin. They were committed to this idea. Lenin's just as bad as Stalin. It's, when you say Stalin, you say Lenin, it's the same thing. Uh, but Reagan said, no, no, no. He would not change his mind about that. So in effect, I mean, he didn't quite lay it out, but in effect, the message was the Lenin regime, and that's a regime that's much more easy to get on with. Or at any rate, it's more easy for us to deal with this regime that's going back to Lenin. We want to promote this idea of going back to Lenin. I got to say, I'm not exactly a great fan of Reagan, but... Uh, this was very shrewd on his part, and I think uh, doesn't get proper appreciation for this. Good analysis. It's exactly what they were thinking about the Soviet Union, so it's good criminology too. Uh, they were thinking about get back to Lenin, but when they say get back to Lenin, what do they mean? We know Lenin preceded Stalin, but we're thinking about the other people in the 20s who might have had power if Stalin didn't, that is say alternatives to, to Stalin. What they were saying when they want to get back Lenin is uh, we took a wrong turn when we went with Stalin after Lenin died. Maybe somebody else would have been better. Who? Trotsky? Zinoviev? Bukharin? Huh? Bukharin. Exactly. And that was the view they ended up with in the Glasnost literature, in which free examination of the ideology of Soviet communism was permitted. <laughs> wow! I didn't know regime has ever done this. Free examination of the ideology of the regime. And this is a regime that's based on ideology more than anything else. They were deciding their future every day in these columns that they wrote about the Soviet past. Who was the alternative? And the alternative, they said, was Buharan, a Leninist regime according to Buharan, the Buharan alternative, they ended up saying. This is pretty much Gorbachev's perspective. It's a the uh, title of a book, or I or should say the theme of a book, uh, by Stephen Cohn, who right now is a kind of defender of Russia. And the, the book, I should have a picture of the book. There, oh, there, oh, there's the book I already showed you. Um, that's Steve Cohn's biography of, of Buharin. Um, and in, the, in that book, he says Buharin was the alternative to Stalin. By the way, I don't agree with this, the history of this. Uh, Buharin aided and abetted Stalin in various ways, muddied up the ideology, created uh, essentially a lot of the ideas on which Stalinism grew. But the mythology about Buharin was he was a right-wing, moderate alternative to Stalin. Wrong, in my opinion, okay? I think it's bad history. But as policy, it is the suggestion that we can go back we Soviets can go back and we can have an NEP kind of regime that say we can admit capitalism under certain limits. Uh, we can have a moderate attitude toward the West. Uh, you remember Buharin was very pro-French, uh, pro pro-British, um, favorable to the West. So, so the, the history is bad history, but the policy that comes out of it uh, might be attractive to a lot of people in the West. It certainly was attractive to Gorbachev, and that's really the ideological tack that they were going to march under from this point on. Reagan was right to say that they went back to Lenin. Um, and Steve Cohn, of course, there he is with his wife, Katrina Vandenheuvel. She's the editor of The Nation. Most of his articles these days appear in The Nation. And he generally argues against you know, uh, stupid policies against Russia, like you know, arming, arming people against them, and 
um, and wants, wants to get back to uh, more sensible policies toward Russia. I agree with him about most things. Um, um, but people in the leadership didn't like this turn to Bukharanism and all this stuff and sort of criticize, criticize Gorbachev. Gorbachev Ligachev was in the position of um, arguing for collective leadership in the Politburo. That's a, that, that is a Leninist norm, collective leadership in the Politburo. We don't want anybody to be a new Stalin. And Gorbachev was kind of like a good Stalin. He wanted to take over everything in the name of these nice ideas. Um, so Ligachev was kind of worried about that. Ligachev got a very bad press in the West. They made it out that he was a Stalinist and all the rest of it. And I guess maybe he was to a degree, but um, basically all he wanted was a little slower, a little more measured reform. Gee, that's all he wanted. But Gorbachev didn't want that at all. Anybody who opposes the leader, anybody who even slows him down, uh, is immediately a threat to get rid of him. They could have a Politburo meeting any day and get rid of Gorbachev. So whatever Ligachev said to try to limit Gorbachev, Gorbachev was going to fight him tooth, tooth and nail. And that is exactly the way it worked out. He fought him tooth and nail. And he took on a big campaign against Stalinism from this point on. So the next couple of years, it's Gorbachev accusing everybody that, it, that opposes him of being a Stalinist and saying he's against Stalinism. And one more, one reform more radical than the next. Um, and of course, better and better deals with the West, and uh, finally, the, you know, getting out of Eastern Europe, um, and allowing the Eastern European regimes to elect their own leaders. Gee, so it was an enormous thing that uh, Gorbachev embarked on. A lot of the ideas made a lot of sense to a lot of people, including me. Um, as you know, I've written a book on this, and I uh, go along with a lot of the things that Gorbachev uh, said. But I, you could see some of them were absolutely fatal to the whole idea of maintaining a Soviet state. Fatal. And Gorbachev didn't, he seemed to buy bad ideas at the same price that he bought good ones. He seemed to think that almost anything that was suggested to him um, was worth a try. And uh, this was one of the bizarre ideas uh, um, suggested to him. Abel Aganbegian, an economist, actually had an opportunity to talk with him at length uh, at a conference, got all of his cockamamie ideas. Um, he said the, uh, the party ought to get out of the economy. He wrote a book about it, said that in Piristroika, that is the reconstruction of the regime, the party ought to leave the economy to run by itself. What? They'd never done that since the beginning of the regime. You could see that would produce chaos, and it did. As a matter of fact, the regime was not in trouble economically up to this point. But as soon as the party got out of it, yes, it started to have trouble. Uh, it wasn't the privatization necessarily in the 90s. It's, it begins here uh, when the party got out of the economy on the advice of Abel Aganbegian. It turned out to be a terrible idea from the economic standpoint. And then another idea that was put, by, put forward by Boris uh, Kurashvili, um, this is a pamphlet of his, uh, Where is Russia Going? Um, and Kurashvili said, oh, the nationalities, he said, uh, Leninist norms suggest that the nationalities ought to be independent, have independent leadership. And uh, they ought to be um, centers of struggle for Pistroika and the supporters of Gorbachev. Awful idea, hideous idea. The nationality is a big problem for this regime. It's going to fall apart if they give the nationalities the slightest inclination uh, that they should be, uh, do, uh, you know, run their own affairs. And say, imagine if they said in the United States that you could have referenda in Texas and California and Illinois and places like that, whether they'd stay in the United States. No, they don't do that. <laughs> Remember Abraham Lincoln? He kept the United States together Pre preventing secession by force. Uh, you know, states don't, don't look so kindly on the idea of their component parts declaring their independence. I know I, I'm not arguing this from the standpoint of justice or anything, just saying that that's what states are like. That's when states have to stay together as states. That's what they've got to contemplate, uh, making everybody happy so they don't secede. Um, 
Uh, but of course, Wheatley said, oh yes, the National Independence Movement was great. They want to sponsor them. Another absolutely fatal idea. And then really, uh, Putin looks back on this and says more or less what I'm saying here. In fact, he blames it all on Lenin. Putin blames it on Lenin. He says it was a time bomb for Lenin to have set up the Soviet Union in the first place, rather than calling it the Russian Federation, calling it the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It was a time bomb, Putin says. And he's not wrong about that exactly. I don't know how I would make an argument against that, because it did turn out to be absolutely, absolutely fatal. So the rest of the story is that Gorbachev went from victory to victory, crushing all his opponents. Finally, he crushed all of the people in the bloc. There's people in pink there, East Germany, Poland, Czech, Czechoslovakia, with various leaders, um, Honecker um, and um, Gross in, um, in, in Hungary, uh, Jakes in uh, Czechoslovakia, Ceausescu in uh, Romania. Now, these people were all against Gorbachev and the reforms. They were scared to death. Now, they figured if this thing goes on, the whole power will collapse. Perfectly correct. Um, and Gorbachev didn't like them as opponents and was really undermining them when he took the Soviet troops out of those countries. And look what happened. They lost control of them entirely. They had elections. The Soviets even had the thought that maybe they might elect people loyal to the Soviet Union, communists who want to stay in the bloc under new circumstances. And that's not the way things work, I think. Once you've been in jail and the jailer, jailer frees you, you're not going to vote for the jailer. You're going to vote for somebody as removed from him as possible. I think, I think that's the way things are in this, in this world. So anyhow, they lost the whole block in 1989. Gorbachev won a great victory, <laughs> but they won a, but they lost the uh, they lost the block. <laughs> and uh, it goes on from there. And uh, he almost did the same thing with the Soviet Union. He was going to allow it to fall apart, and which it did. Uh, but uh, some people in the party tried to stop, made a very ineffectual attempt at a coup in July of 1991. Boris Yeltsin stood up uh, on the tank and uh, defied, and the, the coup people didn't have what it took to arrest Yeltsin, so it was not much of a coup. And, uh, and they finally brought Gorbachev back, but by the time Gorbachev was brought back, Yeltsin was in charge. They had made some calls to the to the generals. They finally did this when the regime fell in December of 1989. The phone calls and decided the fall of the regime. Who was the army loyal to? And the army people said, oh, I think we're loyal, more loyal to Yeltsin than we are to Gorbachev. Um, because he's got a democratic mandate as president of Russia. And Russia CC, um, succeeds the Soviet Union. Well, we have passed by these enormous events and not really explicated them the way really deserve to be, but I don't know if you can do that in a in a lecture format of such a straightened form as we as we have here. But anyhow, I think these are the these are the high points of the um, of the story. Um, this cartoon says the whole story of uh, Gorbachev destroying the Soviet Union. You just do one thing and uh, before you know it, uh, it sets in motion is a natural motion dominoes, you know natural motion, and it ends in the destruction of the Soviet Union. I'm wrong. I disagree with this cartoonist. Challenge him to a duel. Um, this is wrong. He didn't just start something rolling that inexorably ended in the destruction of the Soviet Union. He pushed every domino over with Gorbachev. And um, this cartoon, uh, which uh, says that uh, all of his predecessors and leaders of the Marxist and communist idea all wanted him to go a different way, and he wanted to go some other way. Um, and the um, the caption is uh, "Vorwärtsgenossen," you know, um, forward comrades. Forward, so they have completely different views on the matter. Well, that's the way it looks, and that's the way it more or less turned out. But that isn't right either. Um, Gorbachev thought of himself as a Marxist the whole way. He thought he was saving the Soviet Union. Sorry, but that's a fact. Thought he was saving the Soviet Union. So this, I think this cartoon's all wet too. 
um, does not really does not really express the point. Difficult thing to express. What is democracy? How does a regime that is not democratic? How does it become democratic? What's involved? In that? Well, I don't know. I haven't got an answer to that. It's a difficult question, big question. But I, I can't say one thing in closing about this, that whatever things a regime does to make itself more democratic, and they can be very considerable, I think, many reforms were possible. Uh, one cannot overlook power. One cannot say that the health of the state, the health of the nation, the national interest is secondary to the struggle for democracy. You can't do that. The condition for democracy is that there be a state. You cannot have democracy out in the woods. So the whole question of democracy, in the end, has to be subordinate uh, to the question of the maintenance of the state, the maintenance of the state. It doesn't mean it has to be maintained in the most grinding, reactionary, or traditional way. Many, many changes are possible. The imagination um, would point out many, many alternatives, uh, but they would all have to be compatible with continuing. It's like saying, can we save the family if we destroy the family? No. Can you save the state if you destroy it? What, I, what kind of democracy is that? Does democracy mean a weak state? Not necessarily. There are very strong states that are democratic. So these are big questions. And um, they're big questions the Soviet Union failed to, failed to uh, solve. Soviet communism failed to solve them. Um, and then we don't exactly face them in the same way, but we do face the same, same kinds of questions. And that's the way that's the way we have to leave this subject. So uh, next time I will um, speak a little bit about the Putin regime and uh, whether we can get along with Putin or why we can't if we can't. Um, and on Thursday I will uh, I will send you a final. So stay strong and talk to you soon.